So welcome everybody to CT Colloquium for January 27th. Uh, we're thrilled to have with us uh, Natalie Battaglia from UC Santa Cruz. Um, uh, Jenny Patience will introduce her in just a moment. Uh, before that, just a uh, brief announcement. Uh, neither Minnie nor Ramon could be here, but they asked me to uh, remind everybody that we're having our CC uh, community conversation tomorrow uh, afternoon at, um, at noon, uh, our time here. So please uh, tune into that to uh, hear about a variety of things going on related to the pandemic and, and otherwise. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to turn this over to Jenny to introduce our speaker. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Natalia Vitalia. And uh, uh, she's a professor at visiting us virtually from UC Santa Cruz. And she's pursuing a really exciting array of uh, research programs directed towards advancing our understanding of uh, exoplanets. And so uh, Dr. Battaglia also earned her PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, after pursuing a postdoc in Brazil, uh, went on to um, begin her involvement in the Kepler mission. And so this mission was specifically designed to detect uh, transiting exoplanets and has really with its thousands of discoveries transformed our understanding of the exoplanet population. And uh, Dr. Battaglia led one of the real highlights of the mission, which was the reporting on the uh, analysis, discovering the first uh, rocky planet from that mission. And so uh, today we'll learn about a new mission, the James Webb Space Telescope, and along with ongoing ground-based programs that are designed to advance our understanding of the characterization now of exoplanets. So uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Battaglia to this week's colloquium. I guess I could have started my screen share while you were talking. Let's see if that works. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. I was explaining to Ariel earlier that our hope was to do a site visit to learn from everybody at CC about all of the great interdisciplinary science you do interdisciplinary science you do, but also how to facilitate, um, how to catalyze interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, because here at UC Santa Cruz, we're starting an astrobiology initiative. And um, it's really why I left NASA to, and came back to academia was to do that. And it's not easy. And you guys are doing a marvelous job of it. So um, I really am excited to learn from you. And I hope to get over there one day soon, as soon as it's safe. So the title of my talk is Prelude to NASA's ne Next Great Observatory. Um, and, and I actually won't be talking too much about the logistics of Webb. I, I, what I want to do is give a kind of an overview of where we're at with exoplanets. It is a prelude because we're in this in-between time between Kepler, which was the NASA last big observatory, TESS, which is running right now. And what we're waiting for anxiously is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the way I've thought about this over the years, um, and in fact, I guess that's a good segue to my first slide. I was a graduate student here at UC Santa Cruz in the 90s. I was a third year student um, working with Steve Vogt, and this was the time when the Keck, the first Keck telescope was constructed. And in fact, um, it was an exciting time. Jerry Nelson, who designed the hexagonal uh, segmented mirror, had come to Santa Cruz, had just accepted a faculty position here. And in fact, I'm sitting in his former office. This is Jerry Nelson's old office where he did that work. Um, and my advisor, Steve Vogt, had just commissioned um, the high-res spectrograph, which, as you might know, has been a powerhouse for Doppler spectroscopy to do radial velocity with exoplanets. And so it just so happened that he was invited to give a uh, talk at a conference in Europe in 1995, and he couldn't go, and he asked me to go and present on this data, which was not exoplanet data at all. It was about stellar activity. We were doing Doppler tomography of young ultrafast rotators in the Pleiades cluster. And so um, with my small baby in tow and my mom to help with childcare, I, uh, I went to both Vienna and to Florence for two back-to-back -back conferences. 
And at the Cool Star Stellar Systems in the Sun Conference, here I have the program from that conference. On the very last day, they had a panel discussion about brown dwarfs. And uh, it was in the afternoon, people were tired, it had been a whole week of conferences. And all of a sudden, Michelle Mayor appears, kind of bombs this brown dwarf conference with the blessing of the organizers. Um, to report on his abstract, was, which was actually from a poster contribution. He had a poster, and in the right-hand side, you see a picture of the um, abstract. And it's about their this new LOD spectrograph and how they were searching for low-mass companions. And the very last sentence of the abstract they tacked on at the, at the last minute, our most important result is the detection of a Jovian mass companion to a solar type star. So that's how it started. And of course, as, as you know, this is how it's going. Um, Mayor and his grad student at the time, Didier Kalos, have now been awarded a Nobel Prize in physics for this discovery. And I, so, so I feel like I've had a front row seat to exoplanet discovery from the beginning. When I was a grad student, there wasn't a discipline of exoplanet scientists. We were of science. We were all stellar astrophysicists, um, and necessarily so, because most of the planets are discovered through indirect techniques, that is by observing the stars themselves, you had to understand the stars very well. And in fact, my work in studying magnetic activity and its manifestations on solar-like stars is how I ended up at NASA as a postdoc working with this crazy guy, Bill Baruki, who was proposing a different technique. So I characterized that era in the 90s, and maybe the early 2000s, as the era of postage stamp collecting. Here is an artist's rendering of that very first planet, 51 Peg B. Every new planet discovery was cherished and so exciting, and we, we dawdled over every single one and marveled at it. Um, and so it was kind of like collecting stamps at that time. And that went on for about a decade. And I wanted to back up a little bit as well, um, because when Dave Koch, who was the deputy PI of Kepler, when he retired um, before, or I guess right around the launch of Kepler, maybe, maybe some months after the launch of Kepler, Dave Koch retired. He was very ill. He ended up passing away from ALS not that long after, um, which was tragic, um, a big hit to the team. And before, but before he retired and left, he gave me two publications. One, and they're both strategic thinking documents from the early 90s. One is called Tops Towards Other Planetary Systems, a report by the Solar System Exploration Division. And it's about this dream of finding extrasolar planets. It was published in 1992. I think they started the study in 1988 even. So it, it predated um, Michelle Mayor and Didier Kalos's, um first discovery. And as usually happens, they got it very wrong. Um, so in this document, um, I copied some text here. They say the radial velocity approach measures the oscillations of the velocity of motion along the line of sight. Um, and they mention astrometry as actually the technique whereby you see the motion of the star as it orbits the common center of mass projected onto the sky. And they say all current searches for planets of other stars are based on one of these complementary techniques, which are sensitive to planets in different kinds of orbits. And they have this diagram that I'm showing here on the right um, to show the sensitivity of the Doppler method and the um, astrometry method. And I, I think that they were blinded by this. And, and it's interesting because if you look at the V and the E, um, down here in the bottom of the diagram, that's Venus and Earth, that's where Venus and Earth sit, and they are not in that sensitivity space. Um, and even so, they're talking about space-based missions. Um, 
and so the book goes on for many, many, a hundred pages or so talking about the Doppler method and but mostly about the astrometry me method that was being put forward uh, by engineers at JPL at the time. And there's a one page summary of the transit method this idea of detecting the periodic dimming of light due to an exoplanet if it's aligned in the right way and the, with the right eclipse geometry. And so on that page, they say, well, okay, a large study of M dwarfs could be done with a large area CCD, perhaps as many as 100 stars within one square degree might be observed simultaneously. That's on page 69. In 1996, after the first exoplanet discovery by Mayor and Kilos, um, another strategic thinking document came out. This was a roadmap for the exploration of neighboring planetary systems. Um, and in this book, it talks very disparagingly about the transit method. Unfortunately, the effect is difficult to measure. And then it goes on about all of the reasons why it's difficult to measure. And then it says that there are several groups in the US and Europe who are looking into it and suggest that a one meter space telescope continuously monitoring um, or might continuously monitor up to 5,000 stars for a period of four years and detect an Earth. 5,000 stars. So it just, it's a nice cautionary tale not to take ourselves too seriously when we're doing our strategic thinking exercises because the scene can change dramatically. And dramatically it did. So this is just one snapshot of one of the 84 um, electronic channels on the Kepler Space Telescope. Every tiny white dot that you see is a star. We monitored not just one degree, but a hundred square degrees on the sky. Um, the detector technology had improved significantly. We had large format CCDs. We had higher, more efficient, um, higher speed CPUs to do number crunching. We were able to simultaneously observe 200,000 stars for four years. And so, um, of course, that changed the scene dramatically. Here's a blow up of one of those postage stamps, one, one of those Sorry, not to use the same metaphor for a different purpose, but um, we call these postage stamps because they are the pixels surrounding one star. Of course, here you see multiple stars in the bottom left-hand corner. There's a neighboring star, so the field is quite crowded. Um, and this is a time series of these um, pixels that are measure measuring the number of photons that are falling on them, which is a brightness measurement. And we take those pixels and we turn each postage stamp at each time into a brightness measurement. That's what you see in the middle. The blue dots are all the brightness measurements centered on this one diminution of light that occurs when this planet, um, and this is uh, transit, I think, of Kepler-186f, an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, transits in front of its star. So, so we go from pixels to planet and the artist rendering that you see on the right is really this um, nice confluence of scientists giving everything that we do know to the artists so that they can then try to bring it to artistic life for us. And of course, some of it is imagination, but a lot of it, um, well, <laughs> some of it is <laughs> grounded in the physical properties as well. Okay, so I went to the NASA Exoplanet Archives a couple days ago just to pull down the latest, latest of our discovery catalogs. So this is what it looks like as of January 2021. And what I did here was I extracted just the transiting planets, and those are shown on the left, and just the planets detected with the Doppler method on the right. Um, and so these two plots share some common characteristics. Um, first of all, whoops. Um, in this bottom right hand corner in both plots, there are no planets, and that's because of sensitivity. That's the kind of the boundary or the limit to our technology is kind of right here and right here. We can't see anything down there just because we don't have the sensitivity. 
Um, but we also notice up here this swarm of planets. These are the hot Jupiters. 51 Peg B itself resides there. Jupiter size up here at around 12 Earth radii, um, very short orbital periods, internal interior to 10 days, around three days, I think is the sweet spot. Um, and you see that on the right. I, I mean, one of the reasons why these plots look so different is because here for the transits, the observable, the observable that you measure is radius, but over here, the observable is mass, right? The Doppler method gives mass. And so you still see this swarm of hot Jupiters over here, but now with the Doppler method having uh, taken observations, collected observations for what, two and a half decades. Now we have the sensitivity pushing out beyond a thousand days. And we have this swarm also of cold Jupiters. You don't see them so much in the transit data because the probability of the transit geometry falls off so rapidly um, as you go beyond um, well, as you go out in orbital period, Kepler's longest transits, um, longest period object that had multiple transits was something like 700 days. Of course, there are a few that have longer orbital periods, but they showed only one or two transits and the rest had to be deduced, deduced from ancillary data, and the rest of the information. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna tell you about this? Um, there's not much in between the hot and the cold Jupiters. Is that real? Um, the mode of the observed distribution resides around here, which is something like three Earth radii, so kind of between Earth and the Neptunes, and I'll come back to this point later. Um, there is a dearth of planets over here in this corner, and in fact, I call, I like to call this with my students, I call this the bird beak because it looks like a bird beak. Um, and the bird beak is pointing right around Neptune sizes. Um, and that's likely due to photo evaporation. So if a planet like Neptune or Uranus um, happens too close to its star through migration, dynamical interactions that bring it close to its star, uh, the hydrogen envelope evaporates away and the planet shrinks. Um, or if you have a planet that's a little bit larger and it has a higher surface gravity, maybe it can hold on to its envelope, but the envelope gets inflated in size. And so that planet would move in. If it migrates in, it will end up moving up to this swarm. If it's slightly less massive, it moves in and it will move down in radius as it's photo evaporated. So, um, there, there's a lot, I could, I could give a whole colloquium just on this diagram and I will come back to it. Um, but I, I should also mention that if anybody has any questions, I prefer that you interrupt me. Um, feel free to speak up and ask the question um, as opposed to saving it to the end. So that's my invitation to you. Um, in this catalog, there are about 4,300 planets. So, um, yeah. so we do have a question. Somebody is raising their hand in okay. response to your invitation. Awesome. I've, I've allowed you to talk. Yeah, thank you. I just had a very quick question. Um, is there a reason why the transit method um, has kind of this clustering structure at um, ten or ten days, and then um, and then the orbital, and then the Doppler method has like this clustering sort of structure at much lesser orbital period. Um, let's see. Are you talking about the hot Jupiter population? Because the hot, hot Jupiter population is centered at around three or four, and it is here as well. Um, no, the bigger cluster, uh, which goes along the, the red, red line that you just drew. This one right here? Yeah. Um, so the mode of this distribution is around 10 days, and I think here it's also probably around 10 days. I, I think that there's a dearth of planets over here for the radial velocity method because of sensitivity. Um, and, and, and of course, you have to take this all with a grain of salt because when you look back and forth between these two diagrams, you're transferring between mass and radius. 
Um, and also you have to keep in mind that for the radial velocity planets, what you're really measuring is the mass times the sine of the inclination angle. So you're actually seeing a minimum mass. So it's either these values or higher. And I think that that could explain a lot of this population up here, these really massive Jupiters that don't exist over here. And some of these could actually be brown dwarfs instead. Um, I mean, they are up at, you know, get past 5,000 Jupiter masses. And, and M Sinai could make that even worse. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but um, let's plow forward. What, what I can do is I can now call this sample for only the planets that have both a transit radius and a Doppler mass. And then the diagram looks something like this. Um, of course, now we're restricted to just something like 300 day orbital periods and in interior. Um, and so the one of the big questions on my mind as I look at this is, um, you know, the, the radii of the Jupiters, the hot Jupiters are often inflated and large. Um, and uh, the masses, though, are uh, the, the masses of the hot Jupiters actually, to me, look a little bit lower than the mean mass of the cold Jupiters. Uh, which suggests that, that planets that end up as hot Jupiters that migrate in are just typically less massive. And I don't know if that's going to be uh, continue to be borne out by the data. There are so few transiting planets that are out here in the cold planet regime, but this is something to keep an eye on. Okay, but the, the point that I wanted to make in showing these is that neither of these are, are homogeneous catalogs. You, you have here planets identified by many different instruments, many different um, precision levels, different kinds of systematics, different completeness, different um, susceptibility to false positives, um, so, so you have to take them with a grain of salt. Our best hope at a homogeneous catalog is actually the Kepler candidates themselves. So now I've culled out only the Kepler planets and there are about 2,300 of them that have been confirmed that are in the databases that I just showed you. Um, but there's another 1,200 or so that haven't been confirmed, but they have reliabilities greater than 90%. So they're probably probability of being a planet is not at the three sigma or above level. Nevertheless, it's a very high reliability. And in fact, we can quantify the reliability. So if I want to think about occurrence rates or what the intrinsic population of planets in, is in the galaxy, I want to start with a catalog like this that is homogeneous. And when I do that, the first thing you notice right away is that the hot Jupiter population isn't actually that pronounced. In fact, the occurrence of hot Jupiters in nature is actually pretty low. Um, not much higher than it is for the cold giants. In fact, it's not higher at all. It turns out that if we transform this into the occurrence rate space, because the probability of having a transit decreases, in other words, these are harder, you expect to find fewer of them because of the transit geometry. And so it turns out that the occurrence over here is actually a little bit higher than it is over here at the hot Jupiter population. Okay, um, the other thing I want you to see right away in this population, this is the final catalog from Kepler of about 4,500 planet candidates published by Thompson, Susan Thompson in 2018. Um, but the properties of the planets have been updated by getting new star properties from Gaia. And so Travis Berger and Dan Huber from Hawaii actually updated the planet properties. And when you plot it like this, I tried to use a faint symbol on purpose because your eye might recognize now that there is a lower density of points along a band right here. And that band, let me just mark it here. That band is called the radius gap or the Fulton gap. And I'll show you a plot of that later. So just keep that in mind. All right, so what I thought I would do now is just quickly run down in just like five minutes or so what I think are the primary takeaways from the Kepler mission. Now that I've had a couple of years to kind of watch the science play out and synthesize, you know, gain some perspective. Um, so the first one I think is amazingly cool. Um, and, and 
people say this, but let me, let me just say it out loud. The diversity of planets in the galaxy far exceeds the diversity of planets in the solar system. So we can think of that um, in several ways. And I hope that you will gain a deep appreciation of it by looking at various plots. Um, but right off the bat, let's just talk for a second about the exotica. Um, many weird planets have been identified over the years. Um, and here's some artist renderings just to trigger my memory. I don't have time to show you data from all of these different discoveries. Um, but going from the top left over to the top right, um, the top two here are demonstrating lava worlds. So we have this class of ultra short period planets. So um, Kepler 10b was one of the first examples of this and that's the artist rendering in the top left of Kepler 10b. In fact, if you're looking at my video over my shoulder here, up on my bookcase is a globe. I think it's the first globe of an exoplanet ever made. It was made by Dana Berry, who did a Nat Geo documentary, and he painted it as a prop on top of a globe of the Earth. So you can see the Rocky Mountains <laughs> if you look carefully. <laughs> um, all right, so the ultra short period planets are orbiting, I don't know, like 30 times closer to their star than Mercury is to our sun. The temperatures on the surface, just from an equilibrium standpoint, is in excess of that required to melt iron at standard temperature and pressure. Um, they're tidally locked so that the star facing side um, has these extreme temperatures. The other side is out of the sun and is much cooler. So you get an ocean of lava. And if you put these planets even closer, eventually they're going to photo disintegrate, whereby silicates are, are vaporizing and escaping off of the surface. We see evidence of that um, in the transits of evidence of this um, weird transit dimming pattern indicative of a long cometary tail, comet-like tail. And by studying those and also the dipper stars, we can get some idea of grain sizes um, and the like. The third thumbnail, the blue one here, is supposed to represent what I will loosely call the ocean worlds. And I had an argument with Jack Lissauer the other day who says there's no evidence that ocean worlds exist. And by ocean worlds, I don't mean necessarily, I think Steve Desch calls them aqua planets. I don't necessarily mean surface liquid water. An ocean world to me could also be a planet that has a very high fraction of, of ice, of um, solid water in its interior. Um, I think that there is evidence that these exist. Um, we can talk about that later, and I, I will come back to this point about the ocean worlds. But these are the planets that are smaller than Neptune, bigger than Earth, low density, low average density, indicative of some kind of volatile content, and they remain quite elusive. We don't know a lot about them. The next bullet shows the circumbinary planet, so planets orbiting in multi-star systems, even orbiting multiple stars at long orbital period. Um, the next one shows planets orbiting stars in open clusters. Um, and then the final one, this is a thumbnail that was an artist rendering that was meant to denote a planet orbiting a dead star like a white dwarf or a pulsar. Um, but for me, it's also a trigger to remind me of, that there are planets in our galaxy, orbiting stars in our galaxy that are the age of the galaxy itself. And what we are thinking carefully about is how the nucleosynthesis pathways would be different on, uh, for a planet that was formed you know, 11 billion years ago versus like Kepler 444 versus a planet that was formed 2 billion years ago. Um, and there are many different repercussions. It can change the chemistry of the mantle. It can also change the abundance of radioactive species, and all of those have significant implications for habitability. I, this looks like there's a question. No? Yes, there is. Megan, you can talk. Megan? Okay. Well, I guess she's not, not listening. 
No worries. Um, okay, so number two, um, the most frequent planet in our discovery catalogs is a type that we don't have in our own system. I said this in a different way earlier about the mode of the distribution. And let me just show this as a bar graph. Um, here's a bar graph of Kepler discoveries for candidates orbiting in periods less than 400 days. And I colored the bars. So, so this is just the observed radius distribution. The brown, the bars that are brown are those planets that are more or less terrestrial sized. We assume that they have a rocky composition. Those that are colored blue are the size of ice and gas giants in our solar system. And you see the solar system planets arranged not by or semi-major axis, but arranged by radius in our own in our solar system. And um, the gray area in between, literally, we don't have in our solar system. These are the, um, we don't even know what to call them. We call them super Earths or mini Neptunes, but um, it's just quite striking that even though they are the most abundant planet in our discovery catalog, uh, we don't have one. So we really don't understand their nature. And perhaps this is what we would call the ocean worlds. Okay, um, number three, on average, every sun-like star has at least one planet. This is an occurrence rate result. This is what happens when we take the observed distribution over period and radius that I showed before, that scatter plot, and we apply all of the bias corrections to correct for completeness and reliability over the parameter space. And we get a matrix that looks something like this. This is the one published by Eric Ford and his graduate student, um, Dan Lee Su in 2019. And so it's the same period radius space. It goes from about Mercury sized up to about Jupiter size on the Y axis, orbital periods between about one or a half and 500 days, which is the limit of Kepler sensitivity. And the colors are showing the intrinsic occurrence in nature of these exoplanets. And you can see that there's not a hot spot at the hot Jupiters at three days and, you know, 11, 12 Earth radius. There's not a hot spot there. In fact, there's a lull. It's dark blue up here. And it actually morphs to green as you go to the right because the occurrence of giants grows. You very clearly see the bird beak over here. Um, the mode of the distribution that was someplace around here in the observed diagram is now shifting. I, I can't say that it's, I mean, it does look like it's shifting to the right. Um, the Neptunes or even the sub-Neptunes are increasing in, in occurrence as you go to longer orbital periods. Um, but also the terrestrials, there does seem to be a tendency to an in increase in occurrence as you go down to the detection limit. Um, and that bodes well for habitability. All right. Okay, so takeaway number four is related to habitability. So on average, every other sun-like star is expected to host a potentially habitable terrestrial sized planet. Um, if I call the sample over the period, I'm sorry, the radius and not period, but now I'm changing it to installation flux. This is how much energy is being received by the planet. Um, high amounts of energy are over here. So this is equates to shorter orbital period. Um, Venus is around, what, 1.8 or so. So this is something like a Venusian orbit out to about 0.2. And so you're getting out to roughly Mars, a little bit further than Mars in insulation flux. And sizes ranging from about 0.5 to 2.5. This is the sample that Kepler has. Um, the points are colored by their reliability in the catalog. We can measure that. Um, I won't talk about that, but we, we, we do measure that. Um, we measure reliability against astrophysical false alarms, but also instrumental false alarms. And the, um, the contour in the background, the colors measure completeness. And Earth is right here. So there's our Earth symbol. And you notice that Earth stands alone in the diagram. Kepler did not reach the sensitivity to detect an Earth analog. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that, but the most, most important reason is that stellar variability turned out to be a bigger issue than we 
than our models indicated using the sun as a standard. We only had the sun as a comparison. Only the sun has irradiance variations measured to part per million precision, and the sun turned out not to be the perfect analog. And so um, that means that, uh, well, and in addition, NASA had shortened our period of performance from four years to three and a half. And then we lost a reaction wheel that precluded us from doing an extended mission to beat down the, or to improve the precision. So all of those factors came together to just have us just short, fall short of reaching that goal. Um, of course, we have the blueprints and we could build a second Kepler to increase the statistics down there, or we can convince our colleagues over in Europe who are running the Plato mission to reobserve the Kepler field and start to push that envelope down towards the bottom right hand corner. But anyway, this is a nice, healthy sample for, I mean, there is information content here. We have to extrapolate a tiny bit as we go from these planets down to the Earth regime. Um, but when we do that, and if we carefully measure the completeness and the reliability and make those corrections, we do find that the average number of habitable zone planets per star um, per and, and planets are in the range of 0.5 to 1.7 Earth radius, and these are orbiting G and K stars, that number turns out to be about 0.5. So that's a result that was just published by Bryson et al. Um, just a couple months ago. Okay, um, the size distributions of exoplanets is not a power law. This is something that we assumed it would be because of solar system science. Here is a distribution of objects in the solar system um, that goes from Kuiper belt objects down to, you know, near, well, all of the Kuiper belt objects near everything <laughs> that's in the JPL database I plotted here um, in this size range. And you can see, and then the orange line is just a simple power law fit. Um, the solar system objects, at least out to planetary sizes, follow a power law. And so we assume, and of course, we can't extend this out using solar system data because we only have a small sample of planets. Um, but now that we've got 4,000 planets, all from different systems, we can migrate this towards um, to, to larger radii. But, we, but that relation does not translate. Here is a radius distribution. This is in occurrence rate space. It's not the observed distribution. These are intrinsic population numbers, the average number of planets per star in the galaxy. And this is the famous result from um, B.J. Fulton et al. Um, showing the bimodal distribution of small planets. You've got um, this peak of the terrestrial planets, and then you have a lull here around 1.8 Earth radii, and then you have this secondary peak that is peaking someplace around, I don't know, I'm going to say like 2.7 Earth radii, something like that. And then you have this very sharp drop off. And then the occurrence rate, at least, and here we're talking about orbital periods less than I think this result was actually less than 100 days, but I'll be generous and say 300 because it doesn't change too much. Um, not a lot of giant planets, okay, in that period range, which is what we expect from core accretion models. Okay. And then um, there is not a, the final point I want to make is that there is not a one-to-one -one empirical mapping between mass and radius. And why would there be? Well, because in the solar system there is. If I plot all of the solar system planets in a mass radius diagram, um, here they are, they do line up along this more or less nice straight um, r to the second power or something like that relation. And so um, we have these transiting planets from Kepler, whereby we measure the radius. Now we can actually go to our ground-based telescopes and for, I don't know, something like 700 of them, we can actually get the masses as well through the Doppler technique. It's about how many masses we have accumulated over the years. And then you can add those points and their error bars to the diagram. And they look a lot more scattered. 
Um, if I add ISO composition curves, every one of these lines that I've added is for a specific composition of planets. Um, what, what I can say is that for every mass, there is a dispersion of radii. And likewise, at a certain radius, there is a dispersion in mass. The radial velocity people, when I talk to them, they say, oh, that's going to improve as we improve our precision. But the more data we collect, the more I find that we are not going to be able to just argue this away with photon noise. Um, these variations are, are holding and they're statistically significant. So now I go back to my um, now I'm showing both the period radius diagram and the mass radius diagram side by side. I've limited it to planets smaller than six Earth radius, so kind of Neptunish and smaller. Um, and I'm marking certain features. You remember the Neptune desert, the radius valley here. This occurrence cliff I showed in that diagram earlier, and here's what it looks like in the period radius domain. And those features are now visible in the mass radius relation as well. This is a mass radius diagram that I created from public data. The radius valley is readily visible. The occurrence cliff is readily visible. And what I'm showing here are ISO composition curves superimposed on this diagram that are overlapping but different. And the point here is that you cannot get at a unique solution of the bulk composition of a planet through its bulk properties alone, like mass and radius. We're kind of done, right? Unless we have more information until we can... Um, and I'm, what I'm driving towards is atmospheric studies. I'm hoping that the atmospheric studies that are going to be um, initiated by Webb in conjunction with NASA's TESS mission is going to crack this open and give us a new way of looking at exoplanets. So, so basically I started off saying we have this, we have this decade of postage stamp collecting. Then we had another decade of Kepler that gave us this demographic information using bulk properties, which alone are these dull tools for getting at a planet's nature, but taken as a population actually gives us some interesting information. But this next epoch is going to be based on atmospheric characterization. And these are the two big players, NASA's TESS mission depicted here on the right and the James Webb Space Telescope depicted on the left. TESS launched, um, uh, was it in 2018? So a couple years ago, uh, it's already completed its prime mission, which was two years and it's in an, its extended mission. Um, and I'll show you in a second what those discoveries look like. Um, and so now I want to turn my attention a little bit to my team at Santa Cruz and what we're doing and how we're tackling this to prepare for this great next decade. Um, so here's just a snapshot so you can get to know the people involved. These are my graduate students, Ann Dottillo, who's working on occurrence rates, Joey Murphy, who's working on the mass radius relation, Nicholas Scarsdale is thinking about atmospheric demographics and um, helping out with web early release science stuff. Molly Kazirik is an expert on how stellar activity impacts radio velocity measurements. Eric Gonzalez does high spatial resolution imaging to weed out false positives associated with test candidates, but is also interested in finding planets orbiting in binary systems. And then Aaron Carter is a postdoc who unfortunately is trapped in the UK and hasn't been able to physically join us. Um, but he does imaging and transmission spectroscopy, so he does a lot of atmospheres, exoplanet atmospheres, and hopefully will be joining us soon. Um, so I want to pause here and just talk a little bit about preliminary results from these amazing students and postdocs. Um, and let's go back to a theoretical prediction. This is a theoretical prediction from Owen and Wu in a paper in 2017. And it's about how the radiation from a star sculpts the envelope of a planet, like, like a Neptune 
that has a hydrogen or a high volatile content um, atmosphere or envelope. And so in the diagram on the left, what they did with their models was they computed the mass loss rate. And as you would expect, um, this x-axis says envelope mass fraction, but let's just pretend for a second that it's talking about the total planet mass. For smaller masses, you can imagine that the envelope of hydrogen is easily stripped. So the mass loss rates are very fast, they're very short. High numbers here means that mass loss is really inefficient. It takes a long time. So you go up in mass and the mass loss, loss rates get longer, right? But they reach a peak and then they turn over. And the reason it turns over is because there's an opacity transition. And the opacity transition makes mass loss all of a sudden more efficient. And so planets over here at very high envelope masses for the period mass range that the authors considered will actually also quickly lose their envelopes and end up up here. And this peak is at about 3% hydrogen mass fraction. And that corresponds to a radius of about 2.7 Earth radii, which is that peak that we saw before when we were looking at the radius gap. Um, so they talk about a pileup um, at this radius, and that's basically over here in their period radius diagram. And so the paper uses this as a way of invoking photoevaporation to talk about the Fulton gap, which you've seen in previous diagrams. But what we noticed is what we're really interested in is this mechanism over here, whereby larger planets are piling up at 2.7. And we noticed that in this model, in this study, the occurrence cliff was pred predicted to be flat. This is the transition between about 2.7 going to about 4. This transition where you have that very deep plunge in occurrence, um, it looks pretty flat with orbital period. So that's one theoretical prediction. Another theoretical prediction came from Edwin Kite and Laura Schaefer and collaborators. And this is going back to the radius distribution. Here's that double lobed radius distribution that you saw before. And here's the peak at you know, something like 2.5, 2.7 Earth radii. And in this theoretical prediction, Edwin Kite and Laura Schaefer said, well, planets with a certain mass have a certain pressure in which, you, in which case you get what's called a fugacity crisis. And basically what that means is that you've changed the redox state of the mantle of the magma ocean underneath the envelope in a way that ups the redox and allows that planet to absorb or sequester away a lot of the hydrogen envelope. And this mechanism also results in a pile up at 2.45 Earth radius or 2.7 Earth radius. But the interesting thing is that the authors predict that at longer orbital period, you would have a gentler slope. And so that's basically what is shown here between the blue and the red. The red is the distribution that you would get if you have this fugacity crisis. And the blue is this linear dissolution that you would get if more of the magma ocean is able to crystallize. And therefore, you would lose that ability to dissolve the hydrogen from the envelope. And so we thought to ourselves, okay, here's two theoretical predictions that we can test. And so Anne Dottillo got to work on this. And here we go back to our radius period plane. And she said, okay, let me just isolate only these planets in here, which are, you know, in that diagram before we had the double lobed radius distribution. And so we're looking at isolating the planets from like here to here in this range. And let's just look at the occurrence rate of those planets. And she did that and ends up with this distribution in the period radius plane, um, whereby you get this tongue that emerges. That is neither, it's not that flat distribution that was predicted by Owen and Wu in 2017. Um, neither do you get the change in the 
that gentler slope. So here on the left hand side um, is a diagram showing the kind of that cliff, what we call the occurrence cliff. And the pink bars show the short period planets and the blue bars show the long orbital period planets. And if anything, the long period planets are actually showing a more severe slope only at the one sigma level, but interestingly, interesting nonetheless. And, and that is actually what you're seeing here as well. You see the sharper slope as you go to the longer, longer orbital period planets. Um, so I'm showing this just as an example of how these bulk properties of exoplanets are these blunt tools. But when taken as a population and you look at the patterns, you can actually start to put constraints on these theor theoretical models. You can hypothesis test the theoretical models. Okay. Um, as I said, the next era is this atmospheric characterization whereby photons are streaming through the atmosphere in this transit geometry configuration. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. And when you, when you do that, the atmosphere imprints its chemical fingerprint on the spectrum. And so here is a cartoon of the sun observed through the Earth's atmosphere, this very thin kind of five kilometer scale height atmosphere of Earth, um, and a cartoon of the kind of spectrum that you would expect, where you see all of the different gases that are um, creating greenhouse conditions on climate conditions on Earth, things like methane, water, CO2. Notice nitrogen is not there. Nitrogen is the primary gas in our atmosphere. Um, but as you know, I'm sure, there are no rotational vibrational lines of nitrogen to contribute to the spectrum. And which makes it difficult to distinguish an Earth from a Venus, actually. Okay, well, we've done some of this with Hubble. So here is a cartoon of what you get with Hubble. Um, it's restricted mostly to this region between about one and one and a half microns, where you have a strong, looks like it would be methane. That's kind of a poor graphic design. It's actually water. It's a water band that is in that wavelength region. So with Hubble, we were able to see water bands and we did observe dozens of maybe a couple dozen planets with Hubble in this wavelength regime. And here's two examples, two seminal papers in this area, one from David Singh and the other from Ian Crossfield, um, showing giant planets on the left and some sub-Neptunes on the right. And you can see that the um, noise budget is quite high for all of these, and it's restricted to this small wavelength space. All right, um, so now Webb is at Northrop Grumman. Webb is down to the wire. There are very few uh, milestones left that could delay the telescope. It's fully integrated and has gone, by, gone through vibration testing. Um, and uh, this is this beautiful, beautiful video of the primary mirror rotating into view. Um, by this summer, it will be packaged up and shipped through the Panama Canal to French New Guinea, where it's going to launch. Okay, this is this is what we see with Hubble. This is what we see with Webb. Um, and I'm running short on time, so I don't want to cut into Q&A time too much. Um, but what I do want to tell you, I'm going to jump forward a little bit, is what we are doing with... Um, to prepare for this moment. So here is a diagram, like this, this atmospheric characteriz characterization with Webb is going to be applied to the nearest stars. You're going to get the best statistics, the best photon counts on the nearest stars. And so the purpose of NASA's test mission is to identify all of the transiting planets that are near to the solar system. And so here is a right ascension uh, RA and distance plot of all of the known exoplanets. And you see the spray that is the Kepler discoveries here towards the Kepler field of view. And now what I'm going to do, this is within 6,000 light years, but now I'm going to zoom in on 100 light years, which is basically the size of this dot right in the middle that I'm holding with my cursor. So if I zoom in to that dot, this is what the discovery space looks like. 
And of these few dozens of planets that have been observed within 100 light years, um, these are the discoveries from TESS just over the last couple of years. And I'm sure this diagram has changed even since I created it a few months ago. Um, the purple points are the TESS discoveries. Over half of the discoveries of planets, transiting planets within 100 light years are from TESS. So it is yielding this cornucopia of planets that can be subjected to atmospheric characterization. And so what we did to prepare for this moment was we formed a collaboration with our colleagues at um, all the other UCs, University of California's, to submit one large UC proposal to use the Keck Observatory to measure the masses of TESS planets for a multitude of scientific purposes. We also collaborated with Andrew Howard at Caltech, um, Let's see, Caltech and UC, it seems like I'm forgetting. Oh, and we also put in a NASA strategic mission proposal. Um, so we've got Caltech time, oh, Hawaii, Dan Huber at Hawaii, NASA time and UC time. Um, and with the time that we were awarded, we are able to measure 100 masses. So we're going to get 100 masses of test targets. And the reason I care about that is because theoretical work has shown that the knowledge of both planet radius and mass is necessary to properly interpret the planetary spectrum that you get from a telescope like Webb. Um, in these plots, we've got simulated spectra of two planets, one in blue, one in black. The one in blue um, is from a high surface gravity planet that has a low mean molecular weight atmosphere. The one in black is from a low surface gravity planet that has a high mean molecular weight atmosphere. And those two spectra are basically indistinguishable at the 10, 20 part per million level that we get with Webb. It is only if you know the surface gravity a priori that you break that degeneracy. And so what my team at Santa Cruz is, our, our piece of this TKS consortium is actually to shepherd the targets that are most amenable to atmospheric characterization. We are looking across multiple parts of parameter space to try and uniformly populate as best we can the um, planets across this both planet and star properties to uniformly populate that for a demographic study with Webb. Um, let's see, what else do I want to... Um, I guess I will go to this slide here. This is now a mass radius diagram like the one I showed you before, but what it includes in with the star symbols and the diamonds are the planets from TESS that are atmospheric, excellent atmospheric targets that we are measuring the masses of with Keck. And so there are about 50 of the 100 that we um, selected our good atmospheric targets and were selected for that purpose. And you see that they're, they're shown here. Remember, this was the radius gap. This is the occurrence cliff up here. We have masses over here at two Earth masses. We have masses over here at about 20 or 30 Earth masses. That is a real diversity of planets at 2.5 Earth radius. Likewise, we have planets at the bottom of this sub-Neptune distribution, planets at the top of this sub-Neptune distribution, same mass, very different radii. And with bulk properties, we cannot disambiguate their compositions, but we do hope through atmospheric abundance studies and studying metallicity, C to O ratio, methane abundance, carbon dioxide abundance, et cetera, we'll be able to begin to disambiguate those properties. Um, so I think I'll, I think I've spoken um, too long, but here are my takeaways and I do hope we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was, that was a wonderful talk. Very clear and very nice. Um, so we certainly uh, can have a few minutes for questions. If you're willing to stay, we can, we can ask questions for a while and, and folks don't need to feel obligated to stay in the room if you have somewhere else that you need to be. 
Um, it's ideal to please, as always, put questions in the Q&A if you can. Um, that's easier for us to follow than in the chats. You're also welcome to raise your hand and I'm glad to, to uh, enable you to, to speak. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A already. Uh, Maitri Bose um, asks, how can one constrain the surface or bulk compositions of planets knowing the atmospheric composition? It seems like you're going to talk about it, but never quite got there. I had the same question too, actually. Yeah, um, this is actually an open question for me as well. There's some work that's been uh, that that's beginning to emerge on this subject. So if you look from a very kind of eagle eye view and you think, okay, what is the transition from a primordial atmosphere to a um, to a secondary atmosphere, which would be an outgassed atmosphere. Um, so Natasha Battaglia has done some work looking at different ratios of abundances. She's coming out with a paper soon that comes up with a, um, a proposed means of distinguishing or mapping out that transition by looking at the ratio of certain abundances of different molecules. Um, I don't want to give away too many of the details of a work that's not mine. Um, so people are starting to think about it, but this is actually one of the reasons why I'm going out and talking about this, because I don't think that we have good theoretical models to say what to expect. Um, and I think that it, it's the theory is, is going to have to catch up to the observations. We don't really know what to expect as we observe this population of sub-Neptunes for which we have no analog in our solar system. So a lot of this is me kind of hand-waving until we have better data. If, if I can just follow up, might there be another approach of looking at stellar compositional data and propagating through models of planet formation to get some constraints on planet composition that then you feed into? Or is that too many uncertainties? I think that there are so many variables that yield the planetary diversity that we see that it's not that straightforward. Um, I, you know, I gave you a, a flavor for the kinds of theoretical work that's being done in photoevaporation, core powered mass loss, the fugacity crisis, thinking about the interface between the magma ocean and the envelope, all of those things are very important. And we haven't yet talked about stellar abundances, like the difference between in uh, abundances of alpha elements versus iron group elements or the radioactive species. So there's, there's a lot of knobs to turn. Um, and on, on that point, Sumner Starfield notes um, or suggests polluted white, polluted white dwarfs can give you a hint at the interior bulk composition. Really excellent point. I agree. Um, Dan Shim asks, uh, it was, well, first he says it was a great talk. Um, by saying cold Jupiters, are we referring to actual temperature or internal heat of Jupiter type planets, or does it refer to some other properties? I'm referring to the equilibrium temperature that takes into consideration the distance from the star and the energy field, the irradiation from the star itself, not the internal properties, which would be a function more of age and mass. Uh, Abdel Hafiz asks, um, why, are, um, why are the exoplanets discovered by tests within 6,000 light years are scattered in certain directions while the exoplanets within 100 light years seem to be more uh, random in direction? Actually, um, the planets, uh, the directional planets, the spray that you see uh, in yellow, those are not test planets. These are, um, these are Kepler planets. So Kepler observed just one field of view in the constellation of Cygnus and Lyra and stared at that field of view for four years. After that, it did other fields along the ecliptic. And so you see these sprays here and there from those fields, but it only observed those fields for a short amount of time and discovered fewer planets because of the shorter data span, but also a slightly lower precision due to motion. Um, TESS discoveries are uniformly distributed because the whole purpose of test of TESS was to observe one longitude strip for about 28 days and then clock over and then do another longitude strip. And in doing so, cover the entire Northern Hemisphere in the first year, the entire Southern Hemisphere in the second year. So it's an all sky survey of mostly short period planets because of this 28 day data span. Um, but at the poles, there's an overlap region where we can find longer orbital period planets as well. So that's why when we go into the closer regime, we're seeing everything all over the sky. 
Great. Are there any further questions? Those are all the ones that uh, were in the Q&A. Did I miss anything in the chat? I don't think so. So I think if there aren't any further questions, let's please uh, give, uh, give Natalie another virtual round of applause. And uh, thanks very much. That was, that was really a great talk. You're very welcome. Really appreciate Thanks it. For having me. I look forward look forward uh, to having you in person, and then if, hopefully if the anybody wants, future. If anybody wants to um, talk more about the atmospheric targets that we're observing, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to to chat. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.